Okay. Welcome to the Academy of World Farmers Market Coalition, December Studio, Farmers Markets Food Safety and Handling. Uh, this month, we're doing a part one where we have uh, Richard McCarthy, our president, uh, give us a primer introduction on this topic and what you know might be um, uh, most highlightable uh, information. And in December, the, as a part two, um, December, uh, sorry, January 2024, we are going to have a part two discussion of some of the members, our usual format to come in and share with us um, their best practices and challenges um, they have and how they've overcome it. But anyway, without much ado, I'm going to keep going. Okay, so I just did the greetings and introduction. Um, um, as you've seen this before, we have a, a set of community agreements among the members and the guests to our studio. Um, we promise to be present here for this hour um, and be engaged with one another. We will welcome and honor multiple viewpoints as we come from all over the world. Um, it's only natural that we have different, um, different opinions and disagreements, but we are going to disagree softly and hold our judgment softly. We will trust um, each other's intent and uh, at the same time acknowledge the impact that we might have in the way that we speak and interact with one another. We will listen to learn, we will ask to understand, and we will speak up when we need to, and we will also step back to make space, uh, take, uh, make space for others, and we will always assume good intent. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about what this studio is going to be about today. Um, so we we talk about food safety all the time. We are market market uh, operators. Um, World Health Organization uh, defines food safety as the following: unsafe food containing harmful bacteria, viruses, parasites, or chemical substances can cause more than two hundred different diseases. I don't know if you knew that, ranging from diarrhea to cancers. And uh, in particular, we've seen a lot of issues with um, during the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what food um, safety could result into. Uh, and around the world, an estimated population of 600 million people, that's almost one in 10 people, um, fall ill after eating contaminated food each, each year. This is not to say this happens at farmer's markets, but farmer's markets as a you know, food, uh, food outlet and marketplace definitely has a part in it. And in the U.S., our, my country, U.S. Department of Agriculture defines it as conditions and practices that preserve the quality of food to prevent contamination and food, foodborne illnesses. So that's just a uh, formal words to define what food safety is. Um, and we're talking about this for, I mean, I don't need to tell you, for so many reasons, um, food safety and nutrition and food security, all of which we care about are all closely linked. And this is true everywhere in the globe and in particularly in the global South. And globalization of food trade, as you know, has um, has had, and we've been see seeing the impact on the safety of food and farmer's market space is no exception. And ex uh, especially the farmer's market space is actually tricky because we, the, you know, the regulation and the oversight that we have each country and within the country, each uh, regional areas, um, differ. So it makes it very tricky for us, the farmers market operators. And, you know, we know that we need to enhance our capacity to educate, train, prevent, detect, and respond to this um, threat associated with unsafety, unsafe food. And um, that's one of the things here at um, our coalition and the academy want to um, um, uplift and discuss with you. So what about at farmers markets? Whose job is this? Um, just quickly, I try to categorize um, the food safety issues by function. So, you know, cleanliness of space when you produce, um, process um, the products and, and, of course, at the selling space, at the market itself. Washing products, canning and jarring at the value added activities we do with our products, pasteurizing, refrigeration uh, and labeling, of course. Um, so these are, you know, areas by function in which the food safety 
um, guide guidelines and regulation might come in. And also categories by products. If you look at what we're selling and eating, so there's fruits and vegetables, dairy such as eggs, milk, and cheeses, meat, poultry, and fish, and value-added like a canned product, for example, and ready-to-eat street food that, that we buy at the market um, to eat right there and then. So these have different set of guidelines and precautions that we need to exercise. So that's just a really high level um, um, introduction and these slides will be given to you. Um, and here's a main presentation by Richard McCarthy. Richard, are you ready? I'm ready, Robin. Thank you so much for uh, setting the stage of really the critical issue that all of us face. Uh, we know that we trade on this very um, compelling case that we make, that the close proximity between the producer and the consumer should improve our experience, our access to quality food. Therefore, this puts a lot of pressure on us to navigate what is really rather tricky space, as, as Robin described. Um, we are in the business of food retail, but food retail uh, regulations very often do not jibe very well with what we do out in the open, uh, meaning that the food regulations may uh, actually not allow for outdoor sales in like the setting that you see before you um, from, uh, uh, from Bangladesh. Um, Therefore, we have to navigate a space that is specifically what we trade on, which is we build trust by providing quality, safe, healthful, healthy foods directly to the public, but in a rather challenging setting. We do more often than not not have the, uh, the infrastructure that's so valuable, uh, especially valuable to the regulatory authorities, all the competent authorities we have to deal with are expecting uh, certain uh, attributes that we may not have out in the open. So this is, you know, really comes to the core of our business of, of mitigating that risk by providing the direct contact. So if we go to the next slide, uh, what is also true about competent authorities, the local health department, city regulations, maybe your municip municipality or prefecture or county, they lack imagination. Uh, if you go to them looking for guidance, uh, they may not provide it. They're there to mitigate risk to the general public. And, and therefore you may find a healthy, helpful voice, but more often than not, they're there to regulate if they're there at all, which is also one of the, the, the opportunities we have, because if they lack imagination, we should have a great deal of it. All right, next slide. Now the risks vary from place to place. Um, climate, uh, regulatory environment, political context. But one of the things we learned during COVID-19 is that much more attention was focused on markets either because they are such a, you know, ours are such a critical point of food distribution when food distribution systems were uh, struggling during the pandemic. Um, also with the attention given to wet markets, there were more close eyes looking at the safety of markets. But what this also did was that markets changed during this period. There was greater attention from international agencies and also many market practices change. You can see in this image of the, uh, the yellow tape preventing the consumer from leaning in far, although leaning in a little bit. Um, I know that in, in North America where consumers are allowed to choose their product and pick up the produce and bag it themselves, that this practice was ceased during the pandemic. Um, this was a huge cultural shift for people. So. Um, the, the pandemic has provided an opportunity to provide maybe fresh eyes on these on these topics and has given us many lessons. Uh, one of the, the challenges we have as markets is that we may effectively maintain and manage the marketplace, but the problems begin long before the food comes to market. 
uh, we are not on everyone's farms and, and we as the market organizers who have to really approach this almost as if we are the republic of markets and we are both the support mechanism for the farmers as well as the regular regulator, the self-regulator. Uh, but we ourselves are not on the farms on uh, uh, at all moments. So it does raise the question of what are the practices that the farmer has back at the farm? What training can we provide to make sure that there's uh, mitigate the problem of cross-contamination on the farm, uh, food handling from the very beginning, as soon as the, the products uh, come out of the ground. Uh, one of the risks, and this is again another cultural one, is the issue of allowing food to be sold physically on the ground. Uh, again, in North America, and I think I think throughout Europe, one of the practices that is uh, prohibited is to put food physically on, on the ground. Uh, this is an image of the extraordinary farmer's markets in, in Dhaka, where uh, if we look at uh, the next slide, I think you can see uh, the difference between our opening slide, which is the uh, traditional wet market, street market, with uh, relatively low levels of governance and um, and control uh, versus the innovation on the left, which is uh, the new farmer's markets in, in Dhaka. Well, by introducing a large, very large red plastic surface, a clean surface for only the vendors to stand on, that this was the innovation to improve upon uh, just the the free for all of food everywhere on the ground, creating actually a great deal of of um, uh, solid waste, um, but also endangering the public would be the the sort of public health perspective. So these are the kinds of innovations that are culturally relative. The other one would be sneeze guards, and uh, for this, one of the things we love is the physical proximity of the the chef like this agri chef from Italy, um, presenting food that they've prepared on site, but with many, many people standing around. And I'd say that the health departments would look at this and say, well, this troubles us because there's too many opportunities for, uh, for the general public to be sickened or to affect the food. Um, but there are things we can do about it. And I think in particular sneeze guards uh, there's some simple, affordable solutions that are more practical than what the health department would uh, would suggest, which is there should be there should be no prepared foods in the outdoors. Um, now, what we'll show you very quickly is a is a short video that I guess you could start, Robin, um, which shows what a sneeze guard looks like in an open air, air setting. This is from the market that. I helped start and run in New Orleans. You can see that the particular baker has a display set up that is fairly easy to design, very lightweight, so it can be moved in and out. There are requirements of making sure that any of the baked goods, so breads and muffins and pies are set up behind a sneeze guard. And this is a short film of the baker setting up his sneeze guard. It's also very practically designed, you know, it folds, fits into the vehicle, and the ceiling enables him to also put products that are behind glass above the sneeze guard. You can see how rough and worn it's become. You can see it's not made of glass, but of plexiglass. So Winfield uh, Bakery is the bakery in the film. They utilized a very simple sneeze guard that you'll see in markets all over the world. So here's an effort by the farmer 
together with the market to address questions that the health department would raise, but coming up with solutions that are within our reach, uh, rather than saying there should be no value added baked goods in the market because of uh, the, the close proximity between consumer and, and the seller, uh, our solution is, well, we'll just put it behind a portable sneeze guard. Um, we can go to the next slide. We could watch it again, but I think we'll go to the next slide, is the question of refrigeration. We know that this varies from place to place. In uh, this wonderful wintry, probably December image from Norway, um, well, we know that in, in Norway in the winter, refrigeration is not a critical issue. But if you are in Vietnam or um, any other warm climate, refrigeration becomes a huge question uh, to, to ensure food safety of prepared foods, meats, seafoods. And there again, the solutions that may be offered by comp competent authorities is very expensive and unworkable refrigeration. Um, so utilizing and getting a handle on this and getting out ahead of the, the uh, competent authorities enable us to maybe steer what are the practical solutions of providing under refrigeration rather than um, expensive refrigeration cold chain units. And then there is the regulatory challenges that we have. We very often do not fit under the existing code. Um, there are, the code is often um, not anticipating the rise of farmers markets. Therefore, they are not written with us in mind. Um, but what we have found is that the success and I think the competent management of markets has given us leverage to also change the legislation to allow for, and it's unthinkable 30 years ago, but to allow for home canning of low risk products like jams and jellies um, are now allowed for in North America. This is regulated on a state by state rather than at a national level, so at a subnational level, but uh, this speaks to the kinds of skills and expertise that we are developing and we should share. But here's where, you know, there is a huge body of knowledge out there. Um, I think as Robin, um, many of the, the points that she cited, the, the severity of the concern, how widespread um, uh, health concerns are in the markets um, and in people's everyday lives does speak to how seriously this is and should be taken. Uh, the World Health Organization has developed, uh, I think actually a very good guide of thinking about the five keys to safer food. Um, there are links here and, and we'll share the links, um, uh, you know, after the event, as well, after this um, studio as well. Uh, but there is the, the manual, um, five keys for, for safer food that the World Health Organization has prepared. The problem with it, if I can go back just, just quickly, the problem with it is it's very high level. It's at 30,000 feet. It's not useful as a manual for a market. So the World Health Organization afterwards developed a guide to healthy food markets. And that guide and that link is also there. It too is at a very high level of it's useful to help you maybe steer your way through these five key issues, but it's not like a practical guide. You can go to the next slide. Um, I did develop some training for markets in Southeast Asia with FAO during the pandemic, because as I described, this issue became much more cognizant uh, to both uh, uh, local and national authorities. So we began to develop training tools like this one um, that in fresh markets of all kinds, the staff could be trained with uh, these very simple cards. <clears throat> and we have links to this on our, um, uh, on, on our platform to share. This one is designed uh, as a two-sided card. So again, very simple to communicate. This is something to think about. How do we communicate the food safety handling of food and of, of, of waste management to our staff, to our farmers, to our customers? 
this tool was to look at the you know disposal of um, of waste uh, because markets are very often thought of as, as um, places that create a lot of waste. This side of the card is what the um, the staff would read, and then the next slide you can see the back of the card is what um, speaking um, uh, questions and, and and points that you have to be able to present it. So you hold it with one side, they get to, to see the picture and the other side you're explaining what are uh, the methods to dispose of waste properly. So that's one of the, the five points is keep it clean. Uh, the next slide, same format is the whole issue of cross-contamination of raw and cooked foods and how to keep food separately. Many markets may actually have a separate section for where meat, seafood is. Here's the other side of the card where you can see here's the why, the how, and, and again, being able to use these as, as talking points. So number two, raw and cooked food. You get to the third point, which would be the next slide, on uh, cooking food thoroughly. If you have cooked food at the market, it's got to be above 70 degrees centigrade. Otherwise, the potential of contamination is, um, is high. Um, you go to the next slide. Number four, that danger zone between five and 60 degrees centigrade. This is where you want to make sure that the products in your market that maybe you regulate, because the regulators may be there and they may be a problem for the vendors and you may want to outsource that problem and let it be regulated by uh, competent authorities. But you as a market manager may want to be uh, demonstrating that you take food handling seriously and go and test the temperature of the products in the market with a thermometer, mapping it on a weekly basis so that it's, it, it is part of the routine of the market to ensure that the temperatures are either below or above this danger zone. So number four and then number five is safe water. Um, you know, the hand washing, you see this in, in restaurants that employees are required to wash hands. If you have a restroom, the same is true for your vendors. That is often where the contaminations come from, from the, the, the cleanliness of our vendors and the hands. So this is the same card method of here's a simple message on one side and then more details in the next slide on the other side. So there are tools out here that you can use, which is the, the, the value of, of sharing this. Um, so we worked with, uh, in the next slide, Robin, um, we, we've you know, designed some tools and FAO is coming out with the, the full products um, in the near future as a package tool for fresh markets to use and farmers markets fitting into the umbrella in the FAO uh, lexicon of fresh markets, um, of territorial markets. But those are good guidelines for regulatory authorities, the competent authorities. They're also good guidelines for us. And because we do not fit into the um, often the existing regulatory environment, we are often forced to find loopholes. I know that in many markets in my region of uh, where I began to develop markets in the United States, our loophole was that we were deemed not as a marketplace, but as a festival or a fair. Um, and that put a great deal of pressure on us to self-regulate. So the question of eggs, eggs are refrigerated in some cultures, not others. Uh, the temperatures of the seafood, like you can see here, are uh, being checked not by a regulatory authority, but by market staff. Okay, um, and so what we were able to develop, Rob, if you go to the next slide, are looking at the food handling and sanitation in the farmer's market from a standpoint of safety, of risk management. And what we developed with a food safety expert were uh, a scientist were four categories of risk because it's crazy to have the most highly regulated uh, requirements on uh, the least risky products. So we began to develop categories of risk each with each risk getting greater and greater. So beginning with the minimal risk of fruits and vegetables that are meant to be cleaned before going home, well, they need to be cleaned 
uh, or not cleaned, and they need to be explained to shoppers, because of course the farmer is there to do that, uh, that you should clean these strawberries or you should clean this lettuce before you go home. I would say that the market itself trades on this, that there is grit in the lettuce. Um, that tells you it was grown in soil, that it's a real product. Um, but therefore the risk of what is needed in our instance, it had to be uh, off the ground um, and it had to be uh, properly priced, but there wasn't much else needed. When you get to a packaged good without meat, so the baked goods you saw in the video, canned goods, things that are shelf stable, there are a little bit more regulations. There needs to be a um, list of ingredients, a phone number to call on the ingredients if there's any question that emerges, but relatively reasonable amount of regulations. Once you begin to get to frozen or refrigerated meats, dairy products, eggs, this is where temperature controls come in. Uh, the regulatory authorities may actually go and inspect those farm operations on a regular basis, and that you and the market have a, a, a reason to worry about whether these are presented at the right temperature. So fairly high level regulation, self-regulation. And then when you get to category four, these are cooked foods, street foods, hot meals, soups. We determined that in our environment, category four, we'd love these foods in the market, but we were not confident that the health department would allow us to get away with selling these in the market. So category four, we recognized existed, but we could not um, satisfy the health department. Therefore, we didn't allow them in our market. Now, this is going back 20 years. Fortunately, now in North America, there's a much greater acceptance and looseness about street food being sold in the out outdoor setting. They're much more creative about uh, what does the flow of fresh water look like and creating um, uh, mobile water uh, hand washing uh, facilities. But, uh, but it was really instructive for us that this was a category we felt very, you know, we wanted to have in the market, but we did not feel confident that we could negotiate that successfully with the health department. So we identified it as a desirable category that would be kicked down the road when we could um, negotiate it successfully. But by identifying those four categories, we were able to secure the sale of categories one, two, and three. So this is what is meant by developing a risk management strategy. Um, and I think Robin, we can we can start to move to the discussion, which I, I, I encourage you, Robin, to also join in on, which is um, that we need to have a strategy. You cannot just open the market and hope that the health department will be um, uh, supportive. Um, and we know that that's not your story. All of us have had to navigate this rather tricky landscape. And I'd say that all of the issues that you can look for online just by searching, you will find many markets with their regulations. There are some training courses on the regulations specific to the location. I think of the University of Pennsylvania has a very good training course on, on, on how a farmer can be trained to sell at a market. Um, but we encourage you to send us your regulations, how you manage and communicate this to your vendors, to your general public of consumers. And I think it doesn't matter whether they're in your language, um, they, they need not be in English. Uh, in fact, the more languages, the better, the more that we can begin to build, as I know Robin um, has, has requested for our library to have these tools um, many of you have already assembled the ones from your own countries, but sending the tools, the worksheets, the signage, all of it helps us to begin to learn from each other so that we can be um, active protagonists in um, uh, mitigating the risk for our consumers, because this is the very thing we trade on. Robin, maybe I can uh, put it over, take it over to you. Um, because I think you had, you know, really have been 
very vocal in, in encouraging people to share what works for you and what challenge do you have? Like, what is the big challenge, whether it's a product or a time of the year? Um, and what is needed? Because we can also begin to pull from our network, uh, our community of practice, what expertise and what solutions are out there. Thank you so much, Richard. And I apologize for uh, flipping the slides at wrong times. Uh, we should have rehearsed. I should have rehearsed. Nah, no, no. <laughs> uh, um, so for the timing, I stopped sharing screen. Um, so we are, uh, I know December is a very busy month for everybody. Um, so we are very grateful that you're here today. This is a, such an important topic for different reasons from different continents. Um, uh, we want to open up the discussion to hear from you. Uh, what has worked for you? What is still a, a challenge you're experiencing? What would you like to ask other members at the coalition? Um, and what else do you need? And uh, what gets discussed today will be very helpful for us to figure out our part two discussion in January studio, uh, where we're going to invite uh, our member experts from um, different continents to speak together um, as a follow-up to this conversation. So um, you can drop your questions in the Q&A box, or you can drop your comments and questions in the chat chat room here, or you can raise your hands or unmute yourself and start speaking, um, however you'd like to do it. Any reactions or comments to uh, Richard's uh, presentation? Jean Charles, hi. Hey, how are you, everybody? Christina, Robin, Barbara, and President uh, Carmelo. <laughs> Stellarm, uh, everybody, how are you? Uh, I have a quick question, you know, in some, uh, and Richard said that in some, uh, countries where lack of administration, follow-up regulations uh, could lead to uh, an unorganized market where um, uh, I'm talking about Lebanon, basically. We have regulations. We don't have anybody to uh, apply it or to control it or to have, you know, uh, people coming, uh, controllers at our market. But the regulation exists. Uh, when you say we have to write or to uh, <clears throat> provide you uh, do with documents, are you referring to our internal documents, my first question, or the existing uh, law in Lebanon, law and regulations? This is my first question. Second, uh, how in this context, um, because it's 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 not easy to, for for a guy who's or a, a lady who's managing uh, a market to uh, to write and to build rules and regulation to run the market because it's an, a big effort of texting. He doesn't have to uh, to make any mistake or um, uh, omit something. So my second question is: <clears throat> Would the coalition help? in uh, providing the fact that, that we, we, we give all the regulation, help us to put canvas on these regulations for a single market or an organization like the Lebanese one. Thank you. Uh, uh, it, it was clear enough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Robin, do you mind if I, I quickly respond? And I, I no, of course, question. no. It's that the floor is yours, and we're waiting for uh, the next question is already by Dr. Kofi. Okay, um, I, I think that the political environment that you are operating in, of course, will determine how you have to navigate this space. And so, in places where there is not a robust regulatory environment. Uh, there may be rules and regulations. They may not be. Uh, they may not have the staffing to uh, aggressively uh, regulate the markets, and therefore you're kind of on your own. Uh, whereas there are other environments where the regulations are present, the regulators are present, though they're only usually brought out if there is a problem. 
So they respond to a, a request or a problem. That problem may be that someone deems that the food in the market is not safe, or there may be a competitor, an existing supermarket, existing market, another point of sale that deems the arrival of the farmer's market as threatening, commercially threatening, and therefore the regulations are used to squelch some of the competition. Um, these are the political realities in which we operate. And our point of view is that regardless of whether you're dealing with a very present regulatory environment or a very weak one, it really is upon us to make sure that we are securing the safety um, and, and reasonable regulatory environment for the farmers. So whether you're having to replicate existing codes um, or uh, you know, whether you have the capacity to do that is, is, is undoubtedly a good question because we have only so many hours in our day, only so much capacity. Um, but I think there's some existing regulations that can be adapted. Um, and I think you have to adapt them to your setting because of there may be cultural practices. Um, but I think there's also, and, and you know, we didn't show this so much, but there is also the opportunity to post in the market, um, no, you know, not, not aspirational signs of, yes, we, we take this very seriously, food handling, and then you do nothing about it. It has to match with reality. But you can also project this by explaining to the consumer what, what is the regulatory environment of the market. And, um, you know, th there may be some very clear shorthands like, um, you know, all farmers are, you know, subject to this code. Um, all of our uh, uh, value added vendors go through this process. I mean, you could certainly share that with the consumer because we are joining forces with the consumer between the farmer and the consumer in order to make for a um, uh, transparent and reasonable regulatory environment. I'll stop there, but th these are exactly why we think there's so many tools that can be shared. And yeah, I, like, uh, I like the idea, Richard, uh, of uh, showing our concern and interest in this kind of uh, you know, mm -hmm. subject to the, to, to the community also, and huh? the community and, and the producers. So, okay, get, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your answers. And that's an amazing uh, one of the ways uh, to continue building trust with your community as you, were, uh, you started out your presentation with Richard. Okay, I have a question, but I'm gonna go to Kofi first. Kofi, you're up next. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Richard uh, for fantastic uh, presentation that he, uh, he has done. And uh, as if um, he was talking straight to those of us in, in Africa, <laughs> seriously, because um, <laughs> what he presented, a lot of it, particularly when it comes to display of food on the ground, that's the biggest thing that um, Africa faces. Uh, most of the places that have been, uh, Benin, Togo, and uh, La Côte d'Ivoire, and some part, Nigeria, and my own Ghana. Uh, if you go to most of the markets in the um, in the communities, I mean, when the when you visit supermarkets in Accra, that one is different. But when you go to markets, farmers market in the communities where they hold the markets on weekly basis, farmers bring their produce from their farms and they, dis they display them, and then people come from the cities, Accra, and other places to buy, and they virtually display everything on the ground in the dark. You see them, I mean, the, the, the plantain, the bananas, the mangoes, everything is displayed around. And then um, uh, vehicles will also be using the road. You know, most of the markets are located along roads. And this is um, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. I actually um, told a, a friend of mine, uh, who was my mate at the, at the first degree at the university, to, to join this call is uh, Professor Nestor. He, is, he has done a lot of work into food adulteration and those kind of things. So I believe he may talk. Um, he joined today. Mm -hmm. And it's a big problem. 
And another thing I noticed has to do with even the transporters, those, um, the trucks who transport the food items from the farmer's place to the market. You can see that a lot of them, no matter how uh, the farmers might have arranged them because they want to take uh, pack majority of the things to the market, they will just pack them anyhow. By the time you get the market, uh, mangoes that are getting ripe, they have crushed. Uh, the avocados, they, they, I mean, you go home, you cut it, and they, it's like mashed. So these are some of the issues that we may have to take it up seriously um, in Ghana. The, uh, when it comes to the regulation, I think the um, Food and Drugs Board or whatever, or, or Standard Board, they control the higher levels when it comes to manufacturers and those kind of things. But when it comes to the market, the community market, the farmers gate and all those ones, they do not regulate that one, uh, those areas. Those are the uh, district assemblies that the local government, they um, take charge of, of that. They are um, sanitation department. They are in charge of those things. But their major concern is only with vendors who are selling food at the market. I think um, they, they, are, they are their major concern, making sure that those people have registered to be able to sell at the market, but the food on the ground and those things, they are of uh, less concern to them. So I have really learned a lot and I'm grateful to Richard. And I think um, with my organization, we may have to fix it somewhere in our advocacy so that we we'll pitch for some of those, those things for people to start I mean, applying them at the, at the, at the market. The market should, should be decent enough for anybody to be happy to buy things and send home and not getting sick out of that. Thank you so much. Sophie, thank you so much for your um, your insights. Uh, if I can just briefly remark on on what I think you're, you're, you're spot on regarding is the products on the ground. This is a problem if the ground is not well swept or clean, um, if it is a place of great debris and trash and filth, that is a problem. I think this is um, why the response in Dhaka to come up with these um, clean, you know, plastic so it can be wash, you know, washed down as a space that is marked off as this is the safe space for the products and the farmer. You've noticed in the the pictures, if you look carefully, are barefoot. Therefore, there is, um, you know, even the cleanliness there. There's no shoes on the space is a very creative response to what is a cultural norm. It is a cultural norm to have the food on, on, on the ground. And in a way, when you think about you're leaning down, you're closer to each other, it's part of that, that proximity that, that makes the market work. I know that when Vietnamese refugees in New Orleans began their market, the health department would come out and demand that the products be taken off the ground. And therefore they had to build these little platforms and people, the vendors would use the platforms when the health department came. And then the next week when the health department didn't show up, they would uh, put them back on the ground because this is the norm. So I think there's a question of how much do we adjust versus how much do we work with norms? In terms of the transport question, this is one of the major food waste issues um, is the post-harvest handling. What training can we provide to the farmers to improve post-harvest handling. This is better for the market, better for the consumer. Um, and of course, it's better for profitability. If say the mangoes are packed in such a way that they are not crushed, um, what materials do they need? What training do they need? Regulatory authority, authorities are not interested in training, but we as markets are interested in training because we want our farmers to capture higher quality, you know, higher volume of uh, profitability and we want better product for our consumers. And then in terms of the regulators, you're right, they are not there often. Um, they are often, if they are, they may use regulations to harass street vendors. Um, so there, there's the issue about the dignity of those in the informal sector. Um, we are there to defend them, but we are also to make sure that the quality of the food handling is high. If it's not high in all the markets, we in farmers markets suffer. So if we can maintain the dignity for the consumer and the producer by having high quality of food handling, 
um, we, we increase the level, the standard and the expectation in all of these informal settings. So thank you for those questions. I think you really got to the the, right. the core issues. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick, I, so my question actually is a nice segue. It relates to Kofi's on comment and Richard, your comment back. But really quickly, when I went to Bangladesh uh, to see the Dhaka markets in late April this year, the, the red carpet <laughs> or tarp, um, it's it's um actually a genius idea because you go there it's on the the market is on the street like a just like on the roadside um and it's paved road but still on the roadside but you know exactly where the market starts and ends and it's yeah. like it's like and it's red it's very cheerful red not scary red um so you go immediately thinking oh here's the market um and the whole safety cleanliness thing uh, occurred to me as a secondary i thought it was just really for aesthetics <laughs> um and it was like a just really nice demarcation of where the market is so and it's um, as you say richard um culturally uh appropriate and um respecting the local culture so that was really um a low cost solution to address all of them so that's something i think think Kofi and your country um it's alumni here um, um it's a it's a really nice idea to um consider for your market my question is yeah um, yeah. yeah this salon oh hi <laughs> <laughs> how are Sorry. you I mean, yeah yeah so yes, yes. hi to everybody yes i think um yes Kofi is on point and uh, that is why for us farmers market in ghana we as the regulations are not there we always make sure that we have people or stewards who make sure that whoever brings the produce or whatever, at least within the market, we are able to have some level of uh, protection and the safety measures put in place so that uh, as a source of contamination, especially at that particular time, we are able to minimize uh, what the, the, mm -hmm. the consumer is taking away in terms of contamination or the risk of uh, 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 getting a uh, it's not to the standard that is expected. Uh, we are not there yet. And uh, that is why we are always uh, entreating our colleagues to be part of the academy so that we learn from other sources and then we can also implement it wherever we go and how we, we are able to prepare ourselves for the bigger picture. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And I also remember in Dhaka, uh, one of the things that the new markets by WVB uh, was known for is the food safety. People can trust their food is what I heard. And that is not the case. And even in small uh, markets um, locally, I believe um, that, you know, that the food there is not trusted to be clean and safe. So again, the low cost solution does so many things on not only uh, ensures the safety, but also trust. Again, we always come back to trust of the market. We can go to the WBB market and there's a food, a safe food that we can trust. So that's a wonderful, um, I think, um, uh, uh, intervention and solution that I've I've seen. And, you know, Robin, if, if I can play on your word of intervention uh, regarding Salome's point, uh, I, I think also what is so critical is that our presence as market management is there to intervene when consumers are unhappy with or unclear about the food quality of a particular vendor, or they see a practice they don't understand, why is this allowed? This isn't allowed in my supermarket and, and so forth, is that we are there to intervene, um, which is not always a very happy intervention, uh, to field uh, an unhappy customer's question as to why is something occurring. Um, we run that interference for the farmer because the farmer is in the midst of selling, may not be well prepared to handle this issue, may not be handling the issue very well. I mean, there may be a legitimate health concern, but we're there to be looking for the good of the entire market so that a vendor whose practices are not up to code, you know, so to speak, um, are endangering the entire marketplace. And we're there to oversee the integrity of the entire marketplace. So our presence there um, is much more so than 
just to set up the market and collect rent, but actually to ensure, as, as I think Robin described, the integrity of this space, whether it's demarked by uh, a banner at the entrance or this incredible red carpet, that once you come onto this space, there is someone who is managing the space with a certain set of criteria and is there to answer your difficult, awkward questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as compared to say the street vendor who is on his own or her own is very vulnerable to, you know, the difficulties and has to handle everything. So it is the shared responsibility that, that really comes down to that core, you know, questions, do farmers markets just happen? No, they do not just happen. They are managed. And, um, and we take that management very seriously. So that also relates to back to the question I was going to ask, which is so something like transportation um, that might be uh, none of these issues and training, you know, encouraging the vendors to go through training is easy. But uh, transportation, because the reason might be that the, the farmers can make more profit by not ruining their products. Right. But what about some other thing you mentioned, Richard, um, self-management, self, self um uh, regulation. So a lot of markets in you know U.S. and say Korea and other countries, the market, the farmers market is not really recognized as a legal like a marketplace. So then the you know regulations that they already have at the health department are not really in place. So then you said you know as you should the market you know farmers market managers are the self regulating body. So that gets a little sticky. How do you enforce? if I can use the word, um, the vendors to follow the market code without, you know, making them feel like they're being punished. How do you motivate them to say, for example, the bakery, like they, somebody had to invest money to create the guard, right? So mm -hmm. how, how do you convince them and motivate them to go with your self-regulation of the market? Can't be easy. <laughs> well, it, it, it's not easy but it is an extension of all of our other regulatory posture that we have when we are responsible for managing a space, whether it's how much space does the vendor have, where is the vendor placed in the market, who has that authority? And it varies from market to market as to how it's established. But I think that with regard to the food handling requirements, whether it's temperature controls or a sneeze guard, um, we as the market organizers want to see the market succeed. We want to see our farmers succeed. So it requires a great deal of face-to-face uh, -face communication with what is needed or required. Um, but we're not the regulatory authority who does not care what the consequences are it is in our self-interest for the consequences to be happy for, for happy outcomes for all. So we also need to be prepared with solutions. So whether that's training, whether it's finding funding for better transportation solutions, it could be that there needs to be ice or refrigeration during transport or certain um, packing equipment that is is beyond the uh, uh, the grasp of the, the the farmer being able to solve that problem. So we need to join forces to solve some of the issues. And some of these may go again way beyond regulation, being a regulatory authority ourselves, but coming up with the solutions like organizing the delivery of ice to the market. Now that's complicated. No one wants to do that. But if that is the uh, the a necessary step for us to ensure uh, a better handling of, uh, let's say, seafood in the market, that there is ice that is delivered. Then there's the question of, well, what happens when the ice melts? Is there a place that catches that ice? Um, markets for, often have, and, and I think vendors are so creative in finding solutions, whatever you think you could build, they can probably build better. But it comes down to learning from each from other markets to find out what were those physical, practical solutions and, and be prepared to offer the solutions along with stepping up the regulatory environment. I know that when we were establishing our market many, many years ago, 
we met with the municipal regulatory authority and they said, this is wonderful. There's a zoning issue, there's this, but mostly this is wonderful. And then when we got ready to open, the subnational, the state level of the health authority said, well, this can't happen. And we were caught between the municipal and the subnational uh, regulatory authority and ultimately found a solution, which was that we weren't a market at all, we were a festival. And we chose to be a festival because there was an exemption for festivals. And that put us in a strange space where we had some freedom to develop our regulatory environment. This is true in many places, but it requires getting out ahead of it, not waiting for the regu regulators to find you, but actually to go out and find out what is uh, wh what are the leverage points, um, who regulates you, and, um, and they want to see you take it seriously rather than trying to wiggle your way through rules. Um, so whether it is a category one um, issues or category four issues, uh, World Farmers Markets Coalition and the Academy uh, intend to be the uh, place you can come for, you know, uh, figuring out solutions together. Um, so we really look to your contacting us and uh, your active participation in the academy here and the platform, which I'm gonna come back to in a minute. So there are, uh, uh, in addition to the resources that Richard shared in his presentation, there's some others we found that we're going to share in the platform. So uh, one on the right, uh, right here is a Canada, British Columbia Center for Disease Control. And the other two, uh, the self audit checklist. It's a nice checklist for you to use. Uh, that's from New York State, um, USDA, that's American federal level. Farmer, we, we actually have the farmer's markets, rules and procedures and operating guidelines. So these are some examples of, you know, some countries in the world have all these guidelines. Some are just oppressive. We have too many. And WHO uh, ones, FAO ones are too high level. I know there are a lot, like sometimes it's not helpful. But I, we also know that some countries do not have any. Um, so, you know, again, we hope to be that resource to sort through what exists and uh, how we can help you make sense on the ground for your country, your region, and your culture. Um, um, just wanted to show you this, uh, the, the screenshot of these uh, resources. So that will conclude our presentation. But um, one word about the Academy. So. Our Academy platform uh, collects and stores all the recordings of our studios and the mini courses that are pre-recorded, really short um, and, uh, dynamic lessons on the key topics and all of the handouts and the material that, you know, that, for example, you saw today and many others. Um, this is for our members only. And I know that we have a members uh, midterm assembly on Monday, coming Monday to discuss this. You have unlimited access um, you and your uh, uh, staff members of the organization who are members to our um, coalition. So if you're interested uh, in becoming a member, I know that um, the studio itself, this uh, space is open to anyone and everybody in the world. So if you're here today and you're not a member and you're interested, um, there's a link that Christina dropped and then please inquire with uh, with one of us um, from our website um, so we can help you guide um, through the process of maybe considering um, becoming a member. Um, we will have the, oh, time is up. We will, uh, yes, John Charles. Are you raising? Uh, yes, thank you, thank you. Adding adding to what you are saying, um, uh, with the link of uh, sent by Christina, thank you, Christina. Uh, we have, the, the participant can also always join the board member uh, that is in charge of the region for a follow-up, for okay. guidance, for anything, okay? So we I say that for Avedis, I say that for Avedis, who just dropped a few questions uh, about the thing, and uh, I'm sure we will talk in, in, in no time together. 
So thank you so much for pointing that out. We have board members, each of whom uh, represents um, each region of the world. So you have um, supports and resources to reach out to. Um, for January, first uh, studio next year, oh my God, 2024, we will have a part two discussion on this topic with our expert members around the world. So tune in, wait for the announcement with the registration link. And thank you for being here today, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, from wherever you are. And uh, we will have this, this the second session later today. Uh, you're also welcome to join if you can't get enough of us. Thank you so much <laughs> and have a great day, great evening. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.